Now, some of you will have witnessed yesterday's kind of uh, pantomime in the House of Commons where basically Alok Sharma was due to get up and make the case uh, for Boris Johnson's new uh, internal uh, reports, its bill, uh, which basically supposedly, potentially breaks international law, depending on who you speak to. Uh, it turns out that Boris Johnson himself decided it would be a good idea for him to actually present the bill uh, for its first reading. Um, and instead of then changing up and not putting Ed Miliband in the chair, they decided to put Ed Miliband in the chair, despite the fact that he's the opposite number of Alok Sharma. They should have surely, because Keir Starmer wasn't able to attend, thanks to him uh, having to self-isolate because somebody in his household may have coronavirus. Why didn't they put Angela Rayner up? Are they ashamed of Angela Rayner? Are they frightened of Angela Rayner? Is the Labour Party so sexist that they can't have a woman actually represent them as the leader of the party? If I was Angela Rayner right now, I'd be pretty cheesed off. In fact, I might even consider stepping down as the deputy to Keir Starmer. Because what is the point of being deputy leader of the party if when the leader of the party isn't able to attend the House of Commons because of illness, you don't get to substitute for him? Can you imagine the conversation? Ed Miliband, yes, yesterday's man, a bloke who all the Labour rights think was, did a fantastic job. By the way, uh, the bill went through completely um, without any problems whatsoever. And so whatever Ed Miliband had to say, nobody took any notice of, as usual. But if you're Angela Rayner, you'd have to be sitting there going, what is the point of this? Why am I bothering? Why am I taking all this heat? Why am I being the subject of scrutiny? Why are people being critical of me because of the clothes that I wear? And in fact, whenever I get the opportunity to speak on behalf of the party, they don't let me. They've got a real problem with women in the Labour Party, haven't they? 0344 499 1000 is the number. Let's talk now to Stuart Jackson, who is, of course, former special advisor to David Davis, former um, political uh, Tory MP as well, now founder and director and strategic counsel at Political Insight. Stuart, very good morning to you. Good morning, Mike. Wouldn't you be ashamed if you were a woman in the Labour Party this morning, Stuart? I mean, what's wrong with Angela Rayner taking the helm when the, when the leader isn't available? Well, it is a little bit embarrassing from the point of view of the Labour Party, given that this is the party that extols the virtues of diversity and equality. Yes. We, in my party, have had two women leaders. Right. They can't even trust Angela Rayner on a complex issue. Uh, debating with the Prime Minister and Alok Sharma. And I, I think you're absolutely right. But of course, they're peas in the pods. Keir Starmer and Ed Miliband, Miliband they're both uh, cosmopolitan, liberal, yeah. North London, L New Labour. Yeah. And, you know, it's it's a bit of a boys club in the Labour Party. Yeah, you can't have a northern woman represented. You know, you can't have a woman's voice, especially if it's got a northern uh, twang to it. I mean, I find it really... I'd be really embarrassed if I was a member of the Labour Party this morning. It's a bit patronising. I don't see eye to eye with Angela Rayner, but I think, and she's wrong on most policy issues. Yeah, no, I, I agree with that. Naturally, I would say that. But she is uh, a feisty, authentic voice of what the Labour Party used to be about in the north of England, which was representing working people. And I think if they are serious about reconnecting with those red wall seats in the northwest, in North Wales... And in the North East, they've really got to bring forward more authentic voices that people can uh, appreciate and people can relate to. And I, I don't think having a, a failed leader in Ed Miliband, uh, who, who had all sorts of image problems and led the party to a pretty calamitous defeat, uh, in 2015. Well, it seemed, him up it again seemed was calamitous. It did seem calamitous then until Jeremy Corbyn took over. <laughs> Well, everything's relative, Mike. That's it? right. Yeah, absolutely. Now, let's talk a little bit about some of the Tory rebels, because Sajid Javid was one. Theresa May was one. Quite a few Tories abstained rather than actually voting against um, uh, the bill. But I seem to I, I would say that it's a bit disingenuous of some of these MPs who fought on the Get Brexit Done platform and have now turned on uh, Boris Johnson to say, well, we don't think you're doing it the right way. Well, I'm sorry. There is such a thing as, as, as uh, sort of collective responsibility, isn't there? There's a saying you'll know, Mike, that uh, revenge is a dish best eaten cold. Yeah. And a lot of these people uh, were either overlooked or sacked by Boris Johnson. And this is their revenge, to a certain extent, to cause as much mischief. I have to chuckle a little bit about the mainstream media. You know, they're, they're, the, the reporting of it last night was very much, you know, Boris suffers rebellion, Boris scrapes through you know, a 77 majority on the second <laughs> reading of a bill is not scraping through. Right. And even, I don't think the, the this bill will have any trouble next week. B 
because for one simple reason is that the uh, conservative support in the country, people who voted conservative in December, are solid behind this policy. Mm. They may not fully understand it, but they understand the rationale for it. And Leave voters are, are significantly in favour of it as well. And whilst that coalition of support can be kept behind the Prime Minister in this policy, then that that's fine. And those MPs should, Conservative MPs should support it. I would also say it's getting a bit irritating to hear people who've never taken any real interest in international treaty obligations lecturing Brexiteers that this is, quote, breaking international law, unquote. It is not. Mm. We have a system called the dualist system. We do not give direct effect to international treaties directly the minute they're signed. We have to have domestic legislation to give legal effect to that. Yeah. In other words, as Gina Miller showed in 2016, it is ultimately Parliament that is sovereign and can always change a treaty in domestic law. And, mm. and that's something that these uh, people are not conceding. And I think it's rather disingenuous. Well, I think that's absolutely right. Because when you see somebody like, say, George Freeman, uh, who seems to waver around like some kind of, you know, flag in the wind, you're never quite sure which way he's facing. You know, one minute uh, he's all over us like a rash here at Talk Radio. The next minute he disappears off the face of the earth and joins some kind of miniature cabinet position. Then he's now attacking the government from outside of the tent, it would appear. I mean, I don't know what his game is. Well, there are a lot of people that are still deeply unhappy about the decision of the British people over four years ago mm. and are dying in the ditch still over Brexit. To be fair to David Cameron, he wasn't taking that p uh, position. I know you did mention him amongst the five former yes. Tory leaders. Yeah. But he, I think he did take a reasonable and moderate and nuanced approach yesterday. Yes, he I agree. He didn't take the sort of slightly deranged approach that, that John Major constantly takes, which is that, you know, this is appalling, it's terrible for our international yeah. reputation, let's bow down and prostrate ourselves in front of the EU, mm. which is essentially Major's point of view and Blair's. Right. Uh, basically, Cameron said, well, it doesn't look particularly right, but I can kind of understand where the Prime Minister's coming from. And I think that was probably the right approach. Yes, and he also said, oh, by the way, this is a possible situation rather than a probable situation, and it's something that the, the government reserves the right to do if it decides it's necessary to do it. And it's by no means an absolute um, you know, ab you know, promise to do it. But the thing that made me laugh yesterday was Sky TV's coverage, right? If you were watching that, you would have thought that we were invading uh, a country illegally or something. Oh, sorry, that was the last time Tony Blair broke international law, wasn't it? Um, you know, there's no real uh, consequence. It's going to be anywhere near as bad as the result of that particular breach uh, in this particular case. Well, it is gilding the lily to be lectured on propriety and <laughs> international treaty obligations by uh, Tony Blair on so many different levels. I yeah. mean, he, he promised a referendum on a number of EU treaties uh, and, and in the Lisbon Treaty in particular, and it, it actually never happened, no. of course, as we know. But, you know, the fact is what's fundamentally at stake here is goodwill and negotiating in good faith. And when Boris signed the withdrawal agreement and, and enacted it in UK legislation at the beginning of this year, there was an assumption that they did want to have a free trade agreement, uh, the EU, and that, that they would negotiate in good faith. But when they and, they, and incidentally, they have not denied this, when they infer that they will blockade Northern Ireland, they will stop goods from GB going to Northern Ireland, they will regard Northern Ireland as a de facto colony uh, of the European Union, a sovereign, a part of a sovereign state that is, has left the EU. I think that is a serious matter that any self-respecting member of parliament needs to take notice of. And, we, you know, we're not going to concede that the people of Northern Ireland are, you know, a secondary uh, UK citizenship. That is not going to happen. Mm. And, and we have a responsibility to keep our country united. And the other thing is, all these Tory MPs that vote against this bill and, and rebel next week, they're actually making no deal much more likely yes. because they're cutting the legs from under the Prime Minister in his capacity 
uh, to negotiate a free trade agreement by the end of October. Yeah. And interestingly enough, watching Boris yesterday, you know, it was war- it was kind of um, uh, it was reassuring in a way because it was Boris Johnson back to doing what he does best, which is, you know, a bit of bluster, a little bit of sort of, you know, fist pumping, a bit of um, ha- hand uh, uh, shaking and all of the kind of things that he does very, very well at the dispatch box. And I just wish that he could somehow transfer that um, that feeling that he had yesterday into the COVID problem, which I realise is a bit more difficult to solve. But at the end of the day, you know, he's being criticised at the moment by people in his own party for really not being decisive enough. And he's being very decisive when it comes to Brexit. But what can we do to make him more decisive when it comes to COVID? Well, if you look at prime ministers over the last 20 or 30 years, every prime minister leaves office completely knackered, frankly, totally exhausted, frequently ill, although you wouldn't know about it, whether it was Margaret Thatcher, who sadly succumbed to dementia, Mm. uh, John Major, who I think it got very tense and he got very overwrought from time to time. Uh, Even relatively young people like David Cameron and Tony Blair were absolutely exhausted at the end. This is a prime minister who is essentially facing two major crises. One is disentangling the UK from a 40 five-year-old relationship um, in good order when the EU specifically want to make it as difficult as possible and of course a generational crisis health and economic crisis we've never seen before and on top of that he's had a baby uh, or his uh, fiance's had a baby uh, and he's been very close to death yeah I'm not surprised he looks knackered and I'm really not surprised that he he's not on top form 24-7 yeah. because he has had so much on his plate. No, listen, I get all that, but it's not so much about his own personal health and his own personal kind of state uh, of, of affairs. It's more to do with the fact that the political decision-making that he has not done over COVID has, has started to cause problems, not just in the country, but but in the sort of the loyal uh, electorate, the people who voted for him are telling me if he doesn't sort this out, if he doesn't sort out immigration, doesn't sort out law and order and doesn't sort out this COVID business, there's going to be a problem in four years. Well, I I agree with that, Mike. And I I think a lot of uh, a a lot of Brexiteers wish him well and are still supportive. But equally, I have to say uh, that people are getting more and more annoyed about the the handling of covid staunch conservatives i do think he needs a reshuffle i think he needs to bring perhaps some fresh blood into the cabinet he needs uh, really to reboot the the focus of the government around covid and post brexit he needs more good news stories like the um, japanese free trade agreement that was signed last year uh, and he needs to bring back that sense of joy de vivre, optimism, future focus that Labour are nowhere near right. articulating at the moment. And and you're right, if, if we had a more competent and credible Labour opposition and leader, he would be in a lot more trouble. But yeah. he is still level pegging or slightly heading the polls. I think if that changes, there'll be a lot more pressure on him. Oh, I agree with that. Yeah, Keir Starmer has been absolutely hopeless. I mean, despite, again, what everybody says in the Labour Party about how great he is and about how, you know, his friends in the media talk about how brilliant he is at the dispatch box. I find him incredibly tedious, incredibly boring, uncharismatic and completely unable to cut through any form of sort of opposition properly to the the Prime Minister. But I don't know what you've heard about uh, Prime Minister's questions tomorrow, Stuart. Uh, I'm assuming that Keir Starmer will not be able to do it. Um, surely it will be Angela Rayner put up for that, will it? Just to go back to our original I would theme. imagine it, yeah, I would imagine it will be Dominic Raab versus uh, Angela Rayner. I'm told he and might be will... away though, so I'm not sure if it will be him. I think he might be in Washington. Uh, then I've no idea. You're putting me on the spot there. Sorry. It might be. <laughs> but but, but, but it, in that... Um, in that it's it's form for the opposites to face each other, so it wouldn't be normal yeah. for uh, Angela Rayner to face Boris Johnson. No, uh, there's a sort of uh, I, I hesitate to use the term gentleman's agreement, right. but uh, there, there's a sort of agreement between the whips that equals face face yes. off. So obviously, if Dominic's away, then it'll go to the next person, whoever that might so be. So we think it might be Rishi Sunak, um, in which case they might take the opportunity again to hand it to somebody else. But um, if they hand it to Annalise Dodds, that would be hilarious um, as well. Well, she's uh, desperately underwhelming. Uh, she really is. Dodds. She's not, even Labour figures are saying that she's not landing a glove it'd be, on, it'd on be Rishi like, Sunak. It'd be like Real Madrid taking on Woking. Well, 
that's 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 pretty that's pretty uh, accurate i think mike yeah it, rishi sunak obviously is being talked up very much as a future leader i think if you're sensible you never let that sort of comment get to you you know get to you you never develop the hubris and arrogance that you know it's a shoe in i'm going to be leader no. i don't think i've not met one person who's ever said a bad thing about rishi sunak mm. he's very popular in the parliamentary party and in parliament generally but obviously he's he's giving away money now the real tough times will come when he's actually got to put uh, taxes up yes. potentially yeah. if that happens and cut public expenditure and then his metal will be on display as to whether he will be as popular with the parliamentary party and the wider electorate absolutely right well Stuart it's going to be a fascinating week anyway thank you very much indeed Stuart Jackson former uh, Tory MP former special advisor to David Davis now uh, from Political Insights